welcome to this video where we can spend some time thinking more of the implications of sexual health uh, relevant to people with learning difficulties or disabilities. Each time I say sexual health though, I also include in that uh, matters of sex, as in what people do, and um, sexualities, as in what people are. So I may be using the term sexual health, but please remember that could be talking about the physical aspects of sex, as in sex and relationships, um, or also about their sexual identities and their well-being. You'll notice at the bottom of this screen there are a number of uh, Twitter accounts and they're for some of the students and past students, the graduates, of um, nursing at the University of Greenwich. So if you are currently studying with us, feel free to uh, tweet messages to any of those as well. So that's the, um, the nursing and midwifery one. The Inspire is for the Mental Health Nursing Society. The UOGPG is the postgraduate students, so the various master's degrees and postgrad diplomas. And you've got the he sexual health students and graduates as well. When we're considering any aspect of sexual health, we've got to consider how this is uh, relevant to each and every one of us throughout all times, all places, all ages. Okay, sexual health is relevant to each and every person. And quite often with people with learning difficulties and disabilities, look how different aspects of their sexual health and well-being have either been challenged um, uh, uh, or, or certainly not addressed and especially when you get uh, cultures, societies or institutions or even parents and family who try to brush any matters of sex under the carpet and not address these for the person with a learning difficulty or a disability. And also we sometimes hear then the, the horror stories, things about sexual violence, sexual abuse, um, unplanned events around sex. So especially if you're looking at this in the media, you may get some negative reporting on uh, relations of sexual health with people and their learning disabilities. But it's important to remember that whether we're talking of sexual health or sexual pleasure, um, sexual equality, sexual rights, they are all part of human rights and they apply equally to people with learning difficulties or disabilities as to anybody else in the community. These rights are not taken away just because of a person's intellectual capacity. Sometimes, however, especially in cases of severe learning disability, there are obviously um, situations where a person's sexual health and well-being is adapted and understand, understood in very different ways to the general population. And that's why it's important for us to remember that uh, there's no such thing in this world as just one or the other, black or white, gay or straight. It's not as if we're split into these dyads, these opposing dyads of one or the other, that there's a lot of um, um, variation across the continuum. And just as when you're working with people with learning disabilities, it could be and just as when you're working with people with intellectual difficulties or disabilities, it can range from something ever so mild right through to a severe disability. So it is whenever we're talking about sex, sexualities and sexual health, there's a broad continuum uh, that's relevant to each and every person. In 2017, I was fortunate enough to have a publication in an international encyclopedia of social theory. And in that chapter, I was actually looking at this whole notion of sexualities. So not using the term um, in the singular state of sexuality, because although that's what people normally do, is just refer to sexuality, there's a big trouble with that, there's a problem with that. And that is that quite often, people may consider sexuality as this one sort of block monolithic thing. Um, say, for example, with some of the admissions forms in various uh, hospitals, sometimes if they're based on the activities of daily living, there may be a little section on there that just says sexuality. And nurses may find this really difficult, not knowing what to fill in in that box on sexuality. So the advice I always give is to show the client the form, show them where it says sexuality, and say something like, Look, on this form, it asks about sexuality, and by that it means, is there anything with your sexual health that we can actually help you with whilst you're in with us? Now, even if you said something like that, it's opening the door for further conversation. But the trouble is, when it's just written as sexuality, then some people think, oh, 
Do I have to put down whether they're straight or gay or married, living at home with husband and three kids or something? And one nurse told me once that she saw written in that box, over 40. Okay, so it's different people's understanding of what that sexuality means. But the very, the very act of saying it in the plural, if we talk about sexualities, straight away that's going to make people stop and think, oh, what do you mean by that? Is there more than one? And there's your opportunity to educate. Okay, so a really good um, uh, insight into being able to get people to explore this from different angles. So by referring to sexualities. And the story that comes to mind about a, a, an earlier session I did at the university in a classroom of maybe 250 or more students, we were looking at uh, sexuality issues. One of the male students from right at the back of the hall, he shouted down to me, um, David, he said, if, if young children or uh, whatever age they are, realize that they're lesbian or gay, that they're not heterosexual, why don't they just come out about it then? Now, he tapped in some really, inter some really important notions here. This whole notion of coming out, which I'll explore with you in a moment. But basically what he was saying was if a young person or a child realises that there's a difference between what society expects of them, if the society is being portrayed um, as that everyone is heterosexual, that in itself is a heterosexist assumption, uh, presuming that heterosexuality is over and above all others. So therefore it's treating heterosexuality as the default. Everyone's straight unless proved otherwise. But what that does with this whole notion of coming out is it puts this proved otherwise um, as a responsibility onto different individuals. So basically what this young student was saying was if, if children or young people realise that they're gay or lesbian or bisexual, why don't they just come out about it? Why don't they be honest about it, is basically what he was saying. As if to imply that not coming out is therefore somehow deceitful. That in itself is problematic. So I wanted to turn this problem around to the whole group. So say it was 250 students there. I said, right, I'm not going to answer your question directly, but what I'd like to do is to pose a question to all of you. But I'm not expecting any of you to answer me. I just want you to think about this. And you could try this yourselves now. So for all of you who um, identify as being heterosexual or straight, so for all of you identifying as heterosexual, how old were you when you first realised you were straight? Who's the first person you ever told about this? How did they react when you told them you were straight? What did your best friend in school say? How did your parents or guardians react when you came home and told them you were straight? Now, for straight people, for heterosexual people, you don't have to think about questions like that. It's an automatic assumption that everyone is straight unless they come out and say that they're otherwise. But even this whole notion of coming out, what are you expecting people to come out of and come out into? So say, for example, if people are being brought up in a very heterosexual and a very heterosexist society that presumes everyone is straight, and therefore that sort of society may not be welcoming of anyone who doesn't identify as being straight. So when we talk about coming out, it could be that people are coming out of a homophobic environment in which they've been brought up in, and what they could be coming out to is potentially even more homophobia. So that's why it's difficult for some people, even this notion about coming out. Now, when you're working with people with learning difficulties and disabilities, some of them may not have even had conversations around this. Some of them may have been so sheltered by um, infantilizing uh, family or friends or schools where they're not getting um, the sex and relationship education that they really need as individuals. If they're not having that at all, it could be that they're going to be growing up feeling inside that there's some sort of difference, but maybe not even having the language for that difference. And therefore, any coming out uh, is, is therefore going to be even more difficult for them if they haven't got the words for it or know what it is that they actually mean. So when it comes to this chapter on sexualities, that's looking at the fact that each and every one of us uh, um, have our own orientation. So lots of the sexuality theorists would say that yes, we all have an orientation.
But the label or the identity that we that we use for that orientation may not always match up. So supposing you've got a person living in a really heterosexist society and there are some countries in the world where it's illegal and maybe even under pain of death to come out as lesbian or gay. So it could be that someone's growing up realizing there's a difference, but they know that they can't say anything about this to anyone else. And if there's an expectation in that society that, you know, boy and girl grow up, they meet each other, they, they get married and have loads of babies or that type of thing. So there are these heterosexist assumptions, you will carry on the family line. And they do that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their attractions who they're sexually attracted to, or the activities or behaviours necessarily match up with the identity label or their orientation. So in that little example I gave a couple of moments ago, supposing you've got a, a male and female couple that have to get married because in their society this is what is expected of all adults. You get married and then you have babies. But supposing their attractions are elsewhere, it could be same-sex attractions they've got. So this might be a marriage of convenience. They might be doing this to go along with the customs, the law, their family expectations of them, but one or both of them might have attractions elsewhere. And then if they're having activities, behaviours elsewhere, if they're having sex with others, it's all according to how risky that is. Supposing it's in a culture that would make gay sex totally illegal, for example, then where are they going to meet for gay sex? So the very fact of being secretive about it all could be that they're open to blackmail, they're open to violence, they're open to abuse. So all of these different things are taken into consideration here. And when you're working with your people with learning difficulties or disabilities, if they don't know too much about their, their, their attractions, their behaviours, um, how this all fits in with their orientation, if nobody's taken the time to talk about this with them, then that could just add to even more confusion for them. So it's really important whenever you are talking about sexualities, don't just think of using a label for someone. Don't just say, oh, that person's straight or that's per that person's gay, because in a way that can be very stereotyping. If you say, oh, that person's a lesbian, and if you think, oh, I've met a lesbian before, therefore they're bound to all be the same. Yeah, well, they're not. Each and every one of us, we're all very different individuals. So we must be careful not just of stigma, a label, but also stereotyping, presuming that once you've met one, anybody else with the same label or stigma is therefore going to be exactly the same. So when it comes to sexualities, it's important to think of the individual's orientation. What's the label that they're actually using for that? And does that label match up with the orientation? And may their attractions and even their activities, their behaviours, be something different from the label or their orientation. I'll share this publication with you all, so uh, if you have time and uh, want to, please read through that and see some more of the implications uh, on this whole notion of sexualities, and in particular, how it applies for your individual client groups. On this particular slide, there's a very stark image of a filing cabinet, and the reason I wanted to show you this is because it reminds me of what a respondent said in a PhD study about um, a chest of drawers. The study was done by a very dear friend of mine, Dr Edna Asprey Ward. She's a nurse and she did a PhD looking at the psychological impact of abortion on women. Now, uh, the French philosopher Michel Foucault, he used a term called the triple edict, like a, a triple lock, three things that are, that are locked away. And what he meant by that was, in relation to certain aspects of sex, sexualities or sexual health, there are some things that are hidden away. And the triple edict that he spoke about was taboo, so something that we're not going to talk about because it's, it's considered wrong or abject, dirty, um, it, it's taboo. And because of that, it's silenced, nobody's speaking about it. And because of that, it appears as though it's non-existent. And one of the issues uh, in the UK is abortion. Because when you consider that women um, who, who reach the age of 40 in the UK, by the time a woman reaches that age of 40, around one in three will have had at least one abortion. And yet it's something that still isn't spoken about um, openly between people. And the respondent in Edna Asprey Ward's uh, PhD thesis 
She said that um, she thinks of her abortion as her bottom drawer stuff. She says the top drawer is what you open up and show to the whole world. That's you as a public person. Everybody sees what's in your top drawer. The middle drawer is a little bit more private, and that's what you just keep for your family and your loved ones. But the bottom drawer, she said, that's my private drawer, and that's where my abortion is, and I don't tell anyone about that. Now, when you think of any aspect of life, and especially for a person with a learning difficulty or disability, think of any aspect that they may feel um, some shame or guilt about. So guilt is normally an internalized position where a person feels as if they're going to be judged negatively and therefore they're feeling negative themselves about this. There's their guilt. Shame is more of a social thing. It's when others know about it and others treat them with disdain or discrimination because of that. So guilt and shame, two different things, but very much interrelated. So it could be that some people with learning disabilities are even told that sex in itself, even if it's masturbation, sex by themselves, they could be told that that's dirty or it's wrong or they shouldn't be doing it or, or they're going to go blind or different things are going to happen. So look at the look at the messages given to people with disabilities that may exacerbate individual guilt, personal guilt, or shame between others. So anything that seemed to be stigmatizing here, or anything that's taboo. So that's why you've got this image of the, the draw. But then for each and every person um, in relation to our own mental health and well-being, whether a person's got a learning disability or not, look at the way in which mental health and sexual health are interrelated in so many ways. From the first sentence at the top of the screen here, you'll see that it talks about sexual health within the holistic dimensions of care. So as nurses in particular, uh, we pride ourselves on being an holistic profession, caring for our clients holistically. But I would argue personally, that if you, as an individual nurse, are not addressing the sexual health dimensions of your client's um, uh, being, then you are not addressing them holistically. It would be just like a nurse who's qualified, say as a physical nurse and, and a, a, um, an adult nurse, they may be fantastic in, uh, at caring for somebody's wound or their broken leg or whatever the condition is, but if that person then goes through some psychological problems, if that nurse says, well, sorry, I can't deal with that, I wasn't trained as a psychiatric nurse, I am only able to do their orthopedics or whatever it is, then they, they're not treating the person holistically at all. What they're doing is treating them in a reductionistic way, putting them into little pigeonholes. I can deal with your physical nature, but I can't deal with your mental health. Now, nursing says that we're meant to be uniting all of these together, bringing them together. And there's a video later on on this resource talking about the holistic dimensions of, um, of well-being and health for each and every one of us. So whichever definition of um, holistic care you look at, whether it's from the uh, World Health Organization or various national strategies, even here in the UK, they often talk about holistic care and holistic health. So my argument would be if you're not dealing with the sexual health side of your clients, you're not dealing with them holistically at all. But then even from an holistic point of view, Look at the way in which there's an interrelationship, a knock-on effect sometimes between sexual health and mental health and look how things can go wrong. So from the point of view of working with people with learning difficulties or disabilities, look how their reproductive health in particular is one area that society often has a view on. Look at how um, in the past people with um, moderate to severe learning disabilities have even been the subject of whether they should be sterilized. So therefore, society and culture thinks it has got a view on these particular topics, and people with learning disabilities don't often come out terribly well in relation to some of the negative stuff that's spoken about in our societies. Or supposing a person with a learning disability um, does become pregnant, is there a higher chance that the baby is going to be taken from her? Or is there a higher chance she may be encouraged to have an abortion? So there are all of these matters pertaining to sexual health and well-being that would be relevant for your client groups. 
And then even with some uh, mental health conditions, so anxiety, depression, for example, look how they can have a negative impact on somebody's sexual health and well-being. If somebody's feeling depressed, they might not even want to take care of themselves. If they're feeling depressed, they might not be bothered with relationships. They may not want sex. So look at the way in which um, um, any dimensions of a person's mental well-being can have a negative knock-on effect around their sexual health. And also it could be to do with medications. Certain medications may cause um, a lack of sexual arousal, um, uh, erectile dysfunction in men. So there can be side effects of some medications, especially in the psychiatric medications, which could have a negative impact on a person's sexual life as well as their sexual health and well-being. Or maybe even taking certain antibiotics if a woman is on a, um, the oral contraceptive pill. There can be some antibiotics and some psychiatric drugs that don't work terribly well, that weaken the effect of contraception. So if a woman is on contraception, and if it is um, oral hormonal contraception, and then she's being prescribed some other drugs, of course the prescriber really needs to understand the interrelationship between these medicines. Or going back to a person with depression, it could be that the only medication that's going to help them get out of it is actually going to have a negative impact on their um, sexual performance, their, their, their sexual desire. And yet they may say, well, look, if you take that away from me, what else have I got left? So you have to weigh this up, uh, um, the, the balance here between their mental and sexual health to see the best coming out of both of them and try to reduce any knock-on effect of treatment for one thing is going to be negative for another. And the final part of this slide talks about some of the negative implications of stigma, prejudice and discrimination. And I've covered these on another Spark resource that's linked uh, to, to the one you're currently working through. So if you want to see more on that. But stigma literally means a mark or a sign. Now look how people with learning disabilities may have that mark or sign. People may sort of point out to them saying, look at that person over there, whether it's from bullying in school through to later in life, through to not being able to get jobs or being the, the, the brunt of somebody's jokes. Um, what, whatever it is, there could be stigma that your clients are already used to. Now, for some people, working through stigma and prejudice and discrimination against them, uh, working, against, uh, working through that, some people actually survive quite well. And some people will do more than survive, they'll go on and thrive quite well. But for others, it can be a downward spiral to their mental health, especially if it's um, affecting their self-esteem. Because from a point of view of self-esteem, if an individual is experiencing low self-esteem, then it might mean that they just don't give a damn about themselves. So when it comes to having sex or relationships with others, or even being potentially the victim of abuse, from others. It could be that if they don't give a damn about themselves, then they're not protecting themselves. And uh, when you're talking about sex and safer sex and contraception, if a person's not taking care of themselves, then obviously there could be a risk to the other party as well. So it's really important to talk about uh, protection in sex, especially uh, using condoms for safer sex. Again, even when you talk about condoms, though, how many of your clients with a learning difficulty or disability, how many of those would have been taught appropriately and in ways they understand really well about how to use condoms? You know, I'm sure you have heard m much better than me about the little anecdotes of when things go wrong. One learning disability nurse told me once that the first time she ever did a condom demonstration, she was using a banana and she applied the condom onto the banana and one of the people in the room turned around and said, well, but what happens if I haven't got a banana when I want sex? So you've got to make sure that your messages are completely understood to people with learning difficulties. But also, if they've got low self-esteem, then chances are they're not going to give a damn about themselves. And if they don't care about themselves, um, they might still be desperate for love and attention. 
And the third problem is they may be frightened of being rejected. So if they don't care well for themselves, supposing supposing they're talking to somebody about having sex, and if you've just taught them how to use condoms appropriately and reinforced to them how that's going to be a really good thing for them to do to protect themselves sexually. And they might say to the person, well, okay, come on, let's go and have sex, um, but I'll only do it with a condom. And if the other person uses an excuse to get out of condom use, somebody with low self-esteem is far more at risk of saying, oh, go on, then let's do it. Because on the one hand, they're desperate for love and attention. And on the other hand, they'd be frightened to be re rejected. But if they give up on safer sex now today, then why should they insist on it tomorrow? And that again taps into this downward spiral of low self-esteem. It's also really important as well for your particular client group to consider sexual violence, um, non-consenting sex, rape, um, and any, any of the ways in which they may be traumatised by the actions of others and they may find it difficult to speak about this, either because physically they, ha they cannot speak about it, or maybe they haven't got the words, or people just don't believe them. So there are all of these aspects as well, especially around disclosure of any form of non-consensual sex through violence, through to rape. It must be taken seriously and you do need to listen to them. And maybe it means um, listening in different ways. And this is where this particular video ends now. So as you go down the Spark page, you'll see the next one is actually talking about a model of holistic care. So when I started off a few moments ago, by saying how personally I believe that sexual health is an integral part of holistic care as all the world definitions um, declare it is. So I would argue that if you're not dealing with any of this sort of stuff with your clients, you're not caring for them holistically. So if you move on to that next video, you'll see your responsibilities, especially under the NMC code of practice, what we should be doing if we say that we're holistic carers. Thanks for listening.